Um, the second round table of today and during this session we are going to talk about specific methodologies for impact assessment and although some of you might say higher education is a very special sector and it has its own needs for assessment for impact etc uh, we believe uh, in our working group on impact assessment within the Enlight program that we should have a broader look and reap benefits of people who have looked at impact assessment in other sectors. And that's why we're looking at practices in other fields, sometimes related to higher education and research, but sometimes a little bit more further away from the practices of teaching, learning and research. And I have this wonderful panel here with me that are going to talk about their own experiences regarding impact assessment in their own sectors. Before I introduce them, I'll introduce myself, if you allow me to. I'm Jeroen Huisman, I'm a professor at Ghent University in Belgium and a member of the Impact Working Package Group. So, our panel, um, I'll start here from left to right. Andrea Abata from the Panca Etica from Italy. We Thank have uh, Leire San Jose, who is working at this university as a professor in financial economics. So she is from the Basque country, I don't need to explain that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have a quick peek at my list to try to pronounce Balzan Orasbaeva's name yeah. <laughs> quite correctly. Well, so. I've got a thumbs up from her, so that's a relief. Um, she is from the University Industry Innovation Network from the Netherlands. Peter O'Flynn, Private Infrastructure Development Group, United Kingdom. And another representative from the United Kingdom, Sarah Morton. Uh, I give her already the prize for the, the nicest name of the organization <laughs> she's representing. <laughs> Matter of focus. <laughs> Wonderful. So, welcome you all. Um, and organization of this session is quite similar to this morning's session. First, brief interpretation in, in introductions on the themes, 10 minutes max, by each of the panel members, and then the floor is open for you for questions. If you don't come up with questions, here's a serious warning. If you don't ask questions, I will. <laughs> <laughs> right, without much further ado, later. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Uh, Leon. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am Leire San Jose, and I am going to speak about social accounting today. Before of that, some of the ideas, because I have maintained the tension during all of the morning, so that one is good for us. So I will say some of the ideas that you have mentioned before. Some of those that they are like we need to collaborate or together. We need to illuminate. So that one is a good idea, but we need to be, we need to must be honest that sometimes the illumination doesn't come to our <coughs> minds. So maybe we need to try to decide what is impact, how to measure the impact, and how to involve everyone in that, in that impact to be aligned. Also, someone told me about accounting, that it is only about the results. Today, we are going to have, speak about the process of the social accounting, that it is important as well. So it is not only about that result. Also about, about holistic and the resources, what's important. We need funds, we need to collaboration, we need to meet each other, and we are doing that one here. And finally, communication and connections, indicators with a purpose. It is important that we review and we reflect all together in that point. So because of that, we are going to reflect in a different point, maybe. So we are speaking now about social accounting, but for impact purpose. It will be my themes here. We have different points of view, and social accounting could be used for all of those ones. They are common things all together, but they have differences as well. We are speaking sometimes about the social responsibility of university, of organizations, that's it. But sometimes it is about reporting, accountability, we need to measure, and maybe that's when it is about results. It is like some indicators that we need to show to the society. 
also we need to speak about or will speak about the impact. It is not only about what are the results, but what impact has that results, and they depend on what is our influence, what we are doing for moving, for making any change on others. And also, we have sometimes the externalities on organization. It is because of the market, we have some fails, it is some wrong things, and because of that, the society needs to pay for those things that we are doing wrong in, the, in our market. And the social accounting could be for everything. Why? It is because it is nowadays a process in which you are going to develop an information system. But doing that one in the process, you are going to learn, you are going to impact, and you are going to analyze in a different world all of the organization. We are going coming soon to that part. Social accounting, useful for all of these views. One of the examples, it is the first company that developed the social accounting. It is Lantegi Batuac. It is 3,000 people, workers, company, but it is a social economy company. It is because the purpose is to give work for disability people. It is not that easy. It is complicated, but it's doing correctly. However, sometimes it is measured only because of the economical account. It is only because of what is the benefit of for shareholders. The problem is that that company is doing much more. It is doing many activities. It is reducing the cost of the society. So the impact that they have, it is huge. So because of that, other system that explain and to show to the community, to the society, to the stakeholders what they are doing in a different world, in a different form, it is completely necessary. In that part, we have made some reviews and the social value, it is one of the worst topic in now in the impact of the publication in, this, uh, in these uh, topics. We will see on the right that they are maybe not that important or not that aligned with our social value, but we have social return on investment. Maybe you listened before about it. We have also social and environmental sustainability or the social economy, because sometimes when we are speaking about the social values, we link with the social economy. But nowadays, we ask to every company to have a social impact. So because of that, it is quite important not to limit to the social economy, but to all of the organization, the universities as well. Uh, that it is uh, uh, the stakeholder theory, it is the basic of all of my research. It is because when I understand what is the meaning of stakeholders, what important they are, it is different than different agents that we put all together and that's it. It is that we need to involve with them, we need to get a connection, we need to get interaction, activities, relationship, communication, and they are part of our universities our organizations. So because of that, all of the basic of the impact should be involving all of the stakeholders. We have been working with uh, Edward Freeman in some different topics. I'm not going to explain all of them. However, maybe we have here some, we are not totally agree in some of the points. I'm going to explain that one. It is because when we speak about input, if we want to know what is the cost of the organization, it is quite easy, or at least possible, all of the things that we need to develop our activity. Normally, we are controlled. The government manage based on the cost. The university normally manage on that cost as well many times. So normally, it is limited, and it is possible to develop to analysis. Then in the opposite way, we have the outcomes. That is like when we are romantic, we want the outcomes view. but. When we start analyzing, it is quite difficult. We make that analysis and it is illimited. There are quite many things. And the problem, the main problem that you have commented here before, it is the time. It is the impact of outcomes for tomorrow, for the next day, for the future. It is uncertainty. We cannot manage to control all of the outcomes. So because of that, we are based more on the output, but not as the results that we fixed before. It is because those outcomes came to the outcomes. Whatever, if we want to control the outcomes, we will be crazy because we need to do huge 
narrative, and that's not any sense. So because of that, it is positive to do in the narrative, but maybe we want to be more practical. We need to base a bit more on the outcomes, but thinking all of the time on, on the outcomes. Uh, sometimes it is a, the problem that the cost to create and to analyze those, those outcomes, it's higher than the outcomes themselves. So that's one, it is the inflection point in which we cannot continue doing that one. So we could try, but I not agree totally with that one. We need to form some balance or equilibrium. However, our point of view of social accounting it is that we, instead of basing on shareholders, that is the point of view of economic accounting, it is fixed, we have developed, we have a norms, we have a system, we include all of the stakeholders, multiple stakeholders. So instead of trying to develop a measurement, an analysis, a, a history, a picture of the organization based on the stakeholders, it is based on the stakeholders. For doing that one, we have economic transactions. Some of them, they are social, social activities. It is social impact. We agree with that one. But we have many others that they are not market values. They are not included in those transactions, in those, in those economic transactions. So we are trying to do, and we have more than 100 social accounting systems that we have developed for many different organizations. That is the figure that we saw. We were speaking before that sometimes the figures are quite important. It is not only what we explain, but also how we explain and how we imagine that uh, explanation. And that one is our imagination about the shared value for different stakeholders. So we are going to develop a system in which we are going to say how much we are creating for clients, for imagining the universities, for staff, for our students, for the community, for other associations, we could develop that analysis. It is not only what is different indicators, but also we developed all of those indicators to euros. I am going now to that part. So first we have a market value in which we transform and because our universities, they have really a balance. They have a profit and loss. A stand a statement so we could develop that part and say because of all of these transaction payment that we are doing on, in our university the social value it is that one we transfer that one and we do it with value added statement however the simple compart is more innovative or different some of the basic is the same that we are speaking here in different cases or different analysis. It is because we based on stakeholders. We need to speak with a stakeholder, the dialogue. That one, it is the basic of all of the impact. In that process, we start developing impact. It is not because of the impact itself, it's because we want to ask to a stakeholder what is the social value that I am generating for. So we try to mix with them, try to ask them, and try to include all of this information. But in this moment, we have a dialogue, we have a narrative, we have an explanation, a huge explanation. So we need to be narrow that explanation to some variables. Our aim all of the time is that we want to develop on euros. So because of that, we are thinking all of the time in some variables that we could measure in euros. It is not because we are really getting that money, it is because we are creating something that is equivalent to that euros. For doing that one, we are doing this matrix with the variables and then we transform. Each of the variables depend on the association that they develop that one or because we have made an analysis to say how much is its activity that we are developing for. So, utility of the social accounting for impact communication, it allows stakeholders to be informed about generation of value in a different form. Because you are going to say to clients, staff, government, how much you are creating for, because you are paying your salaries because of the company, you are paying the taxes, you are paying the security, all of those are generating of value. 
you could communicate and we need to do an effort. Impact without communication is not impact. We need to do analysis and benchmarking. It is quite important. We are here, nine universities. Normally, when we develop this social accounting, we have experience, for example, with eight museums all together. When they were working, they were so happy, but in the last moment, when you see what are the numbers, each of them, they are suspicious that what are the numbers of others. But we need to do that benchmarking. We could learn and understand and improve our impact because others, they are doing it a different way. So it is quite important to analysis and giving some benchmarking. Policies and strategy, the social accounting, it is possible because you are going to do all of those process, dialogue, variables, translate to euros. You could integrate. We have been speaking before. Integration it is quite important. If we don't integrate with economical part, it will be so complicated, the real impact. Of course, we need to mix this type of models with the narrative and with a dialogue, a real qualitative analysis. I will finish soon. <laughs> Management, it is empowerment of workers, managers, and other stakeholders, because I am a stakeholder of my university. I want to know how much the university is creating for me. Yes, I want to get that information. I am one of the drivers of that impact. But for doing that one, we need to analyze manage and communicate. And finally, we have the influence. It is because when we are doing the social accounting, we could split from different topics. Imagine that we have this balance sheet and we are doing some ratings. Here it is the same. We could do some split because of the gender, territory, SDGs, whatever. We have the information, but in the process itself, we have noticed that we are developing that impact and the transformation, it is the focus of all of this social accounting. Thank you so much, Eskerri Casco and Urbi et Orbi. Thank you. Thank you, Lera. And we move from social accounting to infrastructure. Peter. Yeah, we are, we're sorted. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Peter O'Flynn, I'm a senior advisor in the Sustainable Development Impact Team at the Private Infrastructure Development Group. But who is that and what's, go what's going on there? So Pidge is a investor in infrastructure projects across Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia and South Asia. And over our lifetime we've committed about 5.3 billion to infrastructure projects, be that roads, be that power plants, be that water ferry services across Lake Victoria in different guises over the years. We've had 211 projects that have reached financial close of which half of which, uh, over 50% have been in fragile in the conflict afflicted states. That's enough about what we do, but what we need to do, we are owned by several governments and we need to account for our impact in terms of individuals who've had new and improved access to infrastructure in terms of the jobs that we create and all of the manner. So, what guides us? What guardrails are there? Well, we're informed by our theory of change, and we, uh, last presentation, spoke about influencing factors. So, our influencing factor is the SDGs and the contribution towards the SDGs and the fact that we need to help deliver access to clean energy, access to water, access to other services that may exist. And how do we do that? And so, within our PIDGE theory of change, we focus on four key aspects. One is people. Who is the people who have been, the end users who have been served by our infrastructure, who have new and improved access to infrastructure? We think about planet in terms of the carbon intensity of our investments, of which we are a signatory to the task force on climate related financial disclosures. And we have our own climate policy. We are, think about our wider economy. What is the local project contracts? What are the forward business linkages that actually come about as a result of our transactions? And finally, we have a market transformation component. We invest anywhere from uh, small investments from $1 million to $50 million in some, of the, uh, in, some of the, in some of the countries that we operate. And some of those come with very different purposes. And there are different routes to impact across each of those themes. 
with the market transformation one, we are looking at the extent that societal change may come through as a, uh, as a result of our transaction and what, what can move forward. I just want to say about what we, what we do at Page is we look at both the negative risk side associated with our projects, and this is a slide from the uh, impact management project about classifications of impact. And being considerate investors, we act to avoid harm as well as benefit stakeholders and contribute to solutions and create positive impacts in the world that we, of which we operate. And so we have a health and safety and environmental sustainability team, and they focus on risk identification and ensure that negative risks from our transactions are minimized or that they are approached and managed, and they do that through a relational dialogue with the, our stakeholders. I'm in the Sustainable Development Impact Team. We, we're looking at conducting ex-ante impact assessments of transactions that may or may not enter our portfolio. And then we use that to determine strategic capital allocation that we can monitor that data over time and see how our projects are performing once we've invested in them. And how do, I, how do we engage in that? So we are looking at infrastructure projects. Infrastructure is quite unique in terms of it has a long build time or a long construction time. And so ex ante assessment can be quite difficult. At the same time, we have a need to deploy capital. So we have two core stages of review that we engage in. One is we conduct a clearance in principle at the early formation say, stage of a transaction. Then we conduct an assessment of the, of the important areas of sustainable development impact across that transaction. We articulate a decisions and route to impact for that transaction, be that, that the case is mostly on market transformation or, it, or the transaction really impacts people. We use that to inform go, no go decisions. So for instance, if the pr transaction is not Paris aligned, we won't decide to invest in it. And we, can, we say that there is a better form of our allocation for our projects. And we use that to compare and benchmark provisional scores across the portfolio as we, uh, as we ask our deal teams to collect further information during their due diligence about their transactions so that we're able to compare. So. The deal teams leave, they, we have our conversation, a clearance, and into, uh, a clearance and principle is issued and the first investment committee happens. The second investment committee happens at endorsement stage. And that is where we firm up the impact assessment for the, for the transaction and we try and quantify expectations for m measuring, monitoring and managing the project moving forward. We're, this allows us to compare against the portfolio of transactions that they've had to date, as well as integrate with risk and financial performance expectations. So before I go into the scorecard and how we kind of rate some of the elements, I just want to speak about some of the overlining uh, reference frameworks that are important for impact management within the private infrastructure development group. As we said, one of our North Stars is the SDGs and that we can conduct a uh, context relevant assessment in the countries that we operate so that we understand how is the country performing on that SDG and where are we, where is this transaction that we're engaging in going to help meet that achievement. But we also have the operating principles for impact management which was originally devised by the IFC. Uh, I'm not sure if they're the, still the sec secretariat of that. But that <laughs> is a voluntary impact management disclosure format uh, that, we, that we will publicize every year uh, every, uh, every other year in terms of our impact management processes across our life cycle from due diligence all the way to measuring and monitoring our impact at exit. I won't go into the others in the rest of the time, but there, some of them speak to some of those wider economy points in terms of uh, impact on supply chains and through the joint impact, mo joint impact model and a few other components. But so how do we assess? So. There's two stages, so one is a question on minimal hurdles and desirable features that are within our transactions that align with the strategy that we have. So we look at the additionality of the transaction. We're owned by a mixture of governments, and, so and we are using public money to invest in infrastructure projects in the, in the countries that we operate. And so there's a question of, can the private sector do what we are doing in the transactions that we're engaging in? And so, if, the, if that additionality hurdle was met and the private sector is unable to meet that, either at the, not the same terms, for instance, if a loan is for seven, 10 years instead of seven and the private sector only offers five, 
or uh, through we have an additionality hurdle reached. But and then we say, as I said, as I mentioned previously, we have alignment on Paris Agreement on climate change and uh, expected compliance with our standards. And then we have desirable features. But to go across to the next slide, in terms of how we how we rate it, so. We look at direct impacts on people on planet. We're looking at end users and customers. We're looking at workers and the impact on planet in terms of the carbon intensity of our portfolio. Within our wider economy assessment, we're looking at the dollar value in project contracts that we are uh, awarding to local companies and the forward and backwards linkages that an infrastructure project may create. So for example, uh, we may have a power uh, have a power plant that is providing power to both end users uh, for a utility scale project, providing power to end users and to businesses. And the the extent of which that is important depends on how significant a part of the grid that new power in, uh, uh, investment that we are investing in is. So if it's five ten megawatts, it's going to have quite a marginal impact on our end users, our businesses at the at the bottom of the supply chain. If we're investing into a 30, 40, 50 megawatt of project, it's going to be obviously substantially higher. One of the components I mentioned is that because we're using public money, we are looking at to the extent that we mobilize private sector capital in our transactions. And so we look at to what extent can we leverage private sector finance through de-risking these projects, either through our technical assistance or through, uh, or through some of the early project preparation work that we may do across our companies to mobilize capital when we reach financial close on these deals. And then, we, as I said, we look at market transformation in terms of identifying a market challenge, challenges for market, uh, channels for market transformation where we are replicating or demonstrating frameworks and what we expect uh, the market outcomes and monitoring indicators to be for that for that transaction within a three to five year horizon. I won't go into the bonus points now for time, but um, uh, trust me, it's all fun. Um, so, what does this actually lead to in terms of our investment process? So, as you can see, we've got a summary of routes to impact, which allows us to do a level of internal benchmarking, so that we can say that this transaction aligns more with our impact objectives which have been set by us compared to another transaction. Obviously, these guardrails are reductive in a manner because they will not always demonstrate the full plethora of impact that an individual transaction has. So we also have, um, we also have approvals that say of impacts that might be beyond our scorecard in a particular transaction that we can say if a transaction isn't sufficiently high enough on our impact rail skating. Uh, but the clearance and principal endorsement notes have uh, sustainable impact goals, relevance, and contribution. They have a climate risk assessment for our transact, which look at physical risk of the project site and what's happening, as well as any transitional risks that the transaction may have. For instance, if it's moving, um, if there is a uh, vulnerability of the asset to changes in climate change legislation, and then we look at the monitoring. <laughs> This allows us to report on a bunch of stuff in my one minute left. Uh, it allows us to uh, report on our, on our climate, our sustainable development impact. A point about the, uh, the, the list here is that we also have bespoke monitoring indicators that we, we, we monitor by transactions so that we're able to assess how, they, how are the individual performance is going, as well as um, classify our level of impact against our level of financial risk in the portfolio via a capital allocation. So, final slide, you can read it, but uh, impact, <laughs> man impact management is uh, evol <coughs> evolving and further professionalizing. We find that, you know, the frameworks and uh, developments in terms of the joint impact model and the operating principles of impact management are leading to a increase in professionalization within our space. And that structured banding of these outcomes in terms of how we have set our priorities has allowed us to internally benchmark our portfolio uh, in terms of their de sustainable development impact. And that, you know, this, and the, the challenge of reporting some of that externally and our commitments help us remain accountable to those impact aims throughout our, throughout our investment life cycle. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, sorry to be strict for time, but uh, I want to have...
plenty of opportunities for questions from the audience. So over to Balzan. Thank you. There it is. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> I know it's a challenge for sure. My name is Baljan Razbaev. I manage strategic initiatives at UN, University Industry Innovation Network. And if you wonder where my name comes from, I'm from Kazakhstan. I'm based in the Netherlands, our company based in the Netherlands. And for the past 12 years, we've been working on university industry engagement as our core topic. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today as well. So we will be talking about impact, but impact of external engagement. And I will try to walk you through some of the ways that UIN works with its global community on how to capture and measure impact of external engagement in research, education, valorization, entrepreneurship, you name it. So it has been already mentioned this morning today that Ideally, we would want to have a comprehensive system that will account for all of those different activities. But of course, I think we will all agree it's a very complex uh, activity. So I will give it a go and try to explain you how we approach it. So as I already mentioned, uh, just because we are not part of the Enlight, so thanks so much for having us as externals. I will allow myself a moment to introduce us as an organization. Uh, we've been working with the topics on university business collaboration for many years uh, and it's all started with research so we conduct our own research in collaboration with our wonderful partners from all across the globe on the topics around university business collaboration, entrepreneurial and engaged universities, valorization, impact is also one of them. And then we try to translate that research into very comprehensive and applicable tools and frameworks and that we bring back to universities either for consultancy or through training. And uh, we are very proud to have our global community spread across the entire world. And um, it's, as I said, my pleasure to be here today as well, because whenever we have an opportunity to interact with, with the community of higher education in, uh, professionals and academics, it's always a pleasure to, to, to peer learn. So there are two ways how UIN specifically, and that is also my role, work with universities, helping them to capture um, external engagement impact. We never say that we measure it because it is on the university side, but what we try to do is to work together with our university partners to help them understand where impact happens. What are all those multiple activities that are happening across the entire institution, across all of the faculties, in education, research, that would also involve valorization, entrepreneurship. So it's extremely uh, complex exercise, of course, and we do it together in collaboration uh, with our university partners. So we practice what we preach, we believe collaboration is important, and this is when we work with universities. We also try to bring them all together uh, very important stakeholders from the entire institution trying to understand what is going on in research, what kind of impact is being created there, how we collaborate with our multiple partners, what are those partners and how we perhaps also collaborate with them in education. So, because there are so many multiple pinpoints that might be happening across the entire institution and our objective is then to help universities to map out those activities and understand what is the pathway to impact. And basically that is the core principle, I guess, that we're trying to utilize and that way through a process of many, many different steps, we try to come up with a tailored pathway to impact framework for, uh, that would be tailored to the needs of the specific university. Another way that we work with the universities is that we also try to work on an individual level with academics because they are at the forefront of creating the impact. So what we do believe is that it is important to plan for impact and uh, academics always create that. We even heard today that sometimes they create impact but they may not even be aware of that. So our idea would be then to gather those uh, wonderful minds together and help them understand how they can create their own pathway to impact from start to finish. And uh, that it would be also one of the learning journeys that we try to bring forward uh, to our um, community of universities. But let's just, uh, perhaps I can share with you some of our learnings on how we work with, with impact of external engagement. 
This is something that is not new to you. Logic model, everyone uses it. We also utilize it uh, when it comes to external engagement, trying to understand what goes into engagement, how engagement is being manifested. Are we talking about joint R&D? Are we talking about curriculum design and delivery in collaboration with your external partners? Are we talking about commercialization? What results does it create? <coughs> Looking into outputs, outcomes, and impact specifically. And then, of course, as you can imagine, that would also involve a wide array of different stakeholders. So the idea would be to really break that process down and really look into all of those steps, all of the people who are involved there and how they are benefiting uh, from that exercise. Some of the things that I also wanted to share with you would be, let's say, observations or some of the tenants that we are um, coming across as we work with the external engagement impact is that Engage, different engagement activities, of course, inevitably will be generating different engagement results for different kinds of stakeholders. So whether we're talking about education, research, and valorization, but also what we notice is that it all plays a very cyclical nature in a way. So when you engage in one activity, you might end up also collaborating in a different activity. Let's say you as an academic decided to um, you know, invite a guest speaker to your lecture, but who knows, maybe that can potentially lead to a joint research initiative, and so on and so forth. So we try to look into that interconnectedness of all those elements, also keeping in mind that different types of activities generate different results. Both qualitative and quantitative proxies of engagement results exist. We all know that. It also applies to external engagement. Both positive and negative engagement results are perceived. Very glad that Peter brought that up, because we also see that you called it the risking, and I think it's completely on point. I think it also applies to external engagement. When we talk about external engagement, of course, um, our job probably would be to convince stakeholders that is a good thing to do, but there are inevitably, of course, some you know, negative results that might be coming up from it. Let's take an example of uh, cooperation in R&D. So that is the activity. We mapped out all of the inputs, outputs, outcomes, potential impacts of that activity. And those are all very positive things for academics, for universities and institutions, for your business partners potentially. And there are some long-term impact effects on the society as well. But there is one thing that also we should be aware of, is that when an academic engages in joint R&D, yes, of course, it might create some very positive effects on them. But, on the other hand, it might also decrease the research productivity because there will be less time to undertake uh, you know, some other academic duties. So I guess these are all the things that we should be aware of, especially if we want to take impact measurement, not as measurement, but more so as a performance management system. Because in the end of the day, I think it's not only about measuring impact, it's also about analyzing how this impact can be brought back into the system so that then we can improve that system and create even more impact going forward. Another thing is that, of course, different capital gains can result from the engagement, especially when we're talking about different types of stakeholders that are being um, affected by it. Cultural, strategic, network, economic, I don't want to go too much into detail there, but we, I guess we're all aware that different types of engagement activities can also generate different types of uh, results. And last but not least, I would like to touch upon the notion of stakeholders. And uh, we've been talking about collaboration and engagement a lot today. Impact cannot be created in isolation. Impact is created in collaboration, and impact is also affecting in different array of stakeholders. And if we will take a look back again at our logic model here, um, and we take, again, joint R&D potentially as an activity. Uh, we will have university stakeholders who would be generally collaborating with their external stakeholders, whether it is industry, community, government, or society at large. But then if we will start mapping out the results, the direct beneficiaries of that activities would be the ones who are collaborating with each other. In the long term, when we get to the outcomes and impacts, we will start seeing that that type of engagement might actually affect way more different stakeholders that are participating in such activities. So, in the end of the day, a wide range of stakeholders <coughs> is affected by university engagement results, including academics, professional staff at university, students, societies, communities, and so on and so forth. So, this is why it's so important to map out that process, to know what 
your pathway to impact is. And it is extremely uh, complex exercise, of course, but I think if there, there are certain systems in place within the universities that could be possible. And I will quickly finish with that. So, um, last point that I wanted to make here is that when we talk about uh, impact capturing when it comes to external engagement, there are some core principles that we've noticed could be placed within the universities when it comes to creating this comprehensive system of uh, impact measurement that can actually lead to even more impact. And that would be philosophy, culture, data capturing and collection, communication and awareness, and performance management. Consider it as a another try to sort of bring that all together into some sort of summary. So when we talk about philosophy and culture, uh, we, ex we believe that it is ex extremely important to have at an institutional level some sort of commitment to recognizing the importance of providing uh, the opportunities to create impact and to providing uh, the opportunity to actually go through that pathway to impact in order to be able to achieve that. And of course, in order to be able to capture and measure that impact, the university should have in place a very comprehensive and holistic system uh, with integrity that is robust and transparent when it comes to data management. I think Esther mentioned that today, that it is, it's not an easy exercise, but uh, we see many universities are trying this, and if you manage to bring all those bits and pieces together and you have a CRM system that would know who are your partners that you're collaborating with, what are the results that are being created out there, then it would be a, a very favorable environment for your academics to also create that impact. Impact has to be celebrated. Impact has to be communicated. If a tree falls in the forest, would it even make a noise if there is no one around to hear it, right? So this is what the point, I guess, that we're also trying to make. Um, we talk about case studies, we talk about different blog articles, podcasts, there are so many different ways on how impact can be communicated. And I think it's extremely important to embrace that and also bring all the structures within the university together in order to make that happen. So that also academics can learn from each other because it's extremely important to recognize that kind of success. And the last point uh, that I guess brings that all together is that it's important to bring that sort of into this comprehensive mix of pretty much those pieces that I've mentioned before in order to be able to improve yourself, you know? It's all about improvement as you go. When you account for impact, but also when you account for negative effects, it is possible to analyze and bring it back into the system and hopefully going forward to create even more engagement and create even more collaboration that will bring us to impact. That would be it from my side. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Belga. Thank you very much. It just has one. Over to Andrea. Thank you. So, uh, okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Enlight, for having invited uh, Banca Etica. You were very kind. Uh, so I'm Andrea Batte. I work in the office who manage the impact models and social environmental assessment of uh, Banca Etica. And I'm trying to explain today to you how we assess our impacts and the impacts of our clients. Okay. So just one slide about uh, Banca Etica. Uh, we are an ethical bank. We, are, we were founded in 1999 in Italy, but we have branches in Italy and Spain, where it's called the Fiale Banca Etica. We have the first branch was uh, founded here in Bilbao. And uh, we are a bank owned by a movement of citizens and uh, social organizations. And we are inspired by the principle of ethical finance, which are transparency, participation, sobriety, efficiency, awareness of non-economic consequences of economic actions and that credit as human right. 
So you can see by the principles that we are very common to impact. Uh, what's very typical from us is uh, our credit process because uh, all credit requests are investigated from a double perspective. We have the normal uh, economic and financial assessment that every bank does, but we also have for every loan a social environmental assessment. And in, over, in order to have our loans, you have to pass both of the assessments. So in this way, uh, the bank can disclose the impacts of all the activities of itself. But uh, what we assess, we assess internal and external impacts, trying to measure about internal impacts. We have the corporate, the CSR profile of our organizations, where we're trying to measure the governance, for example, how many women are in the boards of directors. We also try to measure about the work, so if there is a decent work or not, we have quantitative <laughs> indicators. Supply chain, product quality, environment, networks and community, and transparency and legality. But we're also trying to uh, assess the external impacts because uh, we assess the impact of the organization, which is, for example, for our library, the impact of the organization is the impact impact of the normal activities, so for our library it would be culture, but also impact of the loan, which is the direct impact of the bank. So if our library uh, comes to Bank Etica in order to have solar panels, the impact of the loan will be renewable energy. So we have uh, defined 24 areas of impact and we have 40 specific indicators in order to have quantitative but also qualitative data. How we measure it? So every client have to fill in for every loan a social environmental questionnaire on our web based platform. And uh, we have, they have many types of survey questions, close-ended, rating scale, multiple choice, that are defined about on, not only about the size of the organization, but also, for example, if, uh, if they are uh, cooperatives, associations, and so on. Overall, we have 99 questions for big and medium enterprises, 95 for small, 76 for micro. So from questions, we uh, elaborate those uh, questions in order to have indicators, which are more easy to understand. And we have 101 for uh, big and medium, and so on, you can read it on the slide. Then after this uh, first part that is about the CSR profile, so the internal impact, we have two, section, two sections about the external impact. Uh, where the clients can explain in a descriptive way the impacts they generate because uh, only with quantitative data you can't understand uh, the impact that an organization can have. Then they can choose uh, three of 24 <coughs> impact areas and then they have to provide quantitative data for each impact area chosen. For example, if a client choose education and research, uh, area, the organization will have to disclose the number of participants in the courses organized and founded by the bank and the total number of research projects. As you can see, they are very easy questions because we have more than 1,000 evaluation a year, so we can't go too deep uh, in uh, quantitative data, but they can also create a personalized quantitative indicator in order to map better their impacts. We are also starting to map the negative impacts, uh, even if uh, our clients uh, are usually very good because we have many screenings, uh, but we are trying to have data on negative impacts of the loans, for example, the land use change uh, directly connected to the loans. And uh, how we evaluate? Uh, the evaluation is made mainly from social environmental evaluators and checked by banks employees. Uh, where they can comment all the answers provided by the organization, and if the case, they can enter information different from what the client provided without overriding the previous information, so we can have the transparency of the process. Social environmental evaluators are members and volunteers, so they do for free, uh, members and volunteers of the bank, which have different professional and educational backgrounds. Uh, those evaluators are structured in different local and regional groups and this allows us to have different points of view on the impact. 
uh, four specific subjects, subjects which are maybe mm, well uh, very specific. Uh, we have different training sessions made by the bank for the evaluators. We do so in order to improve uh, our data quality, first of all, and uh, because we believe in the multi-stakeholder approach uh, and also uh, in the relationship with our clients. Which are the major challenges? Uh, the first three are because of our activities, so the variety of parties involved, because we have uh, different types, size, scope, legal structure of organizations then variety of credit lines and uh, because we have credit line for specific projects uh, or general one. And then uh, another challenge is to have better data quality of information received. That's why we have our precious uh, evaluators. The ability of organization to recognize their impacts because many NGO, for example, uh, can't recognize uh, and uh, disclose uh, their impacts. Uh, even if they have for their nature, then uh, we are not very able to capture the long-term impact in a quantitative way and the ex-post assessment. We don't have a specific ex-post assessment, but uh, during the economic and financial reassessment, we collect uh, new data from our clients. Uh, as said before, it's, it's not only important to measure the impact, but also trying to drive it and to manage it. We have uh, this tool that is uh, the Impact Appetite Framework, which is uh, a tool made of uh, various indicators that is used uh, by the board and the management in order to set the minimum level of internal and external impact. This uh, kind of strategy is an ongoing process. And in this uh, tool, we have three different thresholds, the appetite, the early warning, and the tolerance, which is uh, the minimum level uh, which, below which there is a serious danger of failure to achieve the, our goals, our mission, and uh, to have a reputational, uh, a reputational risk. So final slide was very quick. Uh, these are some elements that uh, can be helpful for the area, higher education area, but of course not only this, uh, to complement the economic evaluation with social environmental evaluation. So trying to have like a, a theory of change approach when you make a also some new projects to have this complementation. Then the importance of measuring not only external impacts, but also internal impacts of, for example, universities. Then to have specific indicators should be designed for quantitative impact data, because we can't standardize very well those kind of information. Then not only quantitative, but also qualitative information is important because we can uh, collect data about uh, uh, patients, but we will never know how they feel uh, with our projects. Mm -hmm. Then the multi-stakeholder feedback and dialogue. Uh, as I said, the relationship between uh, different stakeholders is uh, really important to, uh, in order to have a real impact on our societies and for our education areas, examples are professors, students, local communities, local associations and so on. And then uh, to integrate impact measurement with impact management in order that uh, uh, the direction of our university is driven also by impact. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andrea, especially for uh, building the bridge from the banking context to higher education. That was very helpful, I think. Okay, how are you doing? Last person to speak, is it a blessing or a curse? I'm not sure yet. But you all look like you're awake, so that's a good, that's a good start. I'm Sarah Morton, I'm one of the directors of Matter of Focus, and we're a company that works with lots of organizations who want to understand their impact, and some of those are research organizations. And one of the reasons is that I myself worked in knowledge exchange and research in fact for many years. I consider myself a bit of the granny of knowledge exchange and research impact because my first job was in 2001. I was called a research liaison officer because we didn't even have the language of impact at that point. So um, 
I want to talk to you a little bit about our approach at Matter of Focus um, to developing impact. But just to say, I was working in knowledge exchange and knowledge mobilization, and like some of my colleagues on the panel, I thought, well, actually, if we're going to do all of this work, engaging stakeholders in research, we've got to really understand, are we doing it right? Are we making a difference? Is it having an impact? And so I really wanted something that would help learn and improve as well as tell the story. So I'm not really coming from the perspective of what does an institution need to make sure it knows everyone is having an impact. I'm coming very much from the perspective of I, I believe impact is the right thing to do, and if we're going to do it well, we need the tools to understand if we're doing it well. So all of our work at Matter of Focus is helping people embed impact into the way they deliver their work. Um, and I think it's really important with research impact to remember that, and I think someone said this this morning, actually, if you can remember who, remind me. Um, it's not like people apply research and then they do something differently, is it? Whoever they are, and whether it's science or technology or social science, they've got to interact with it from their own perspectives, whether they're policymakers or practitioners or members of communities. And so what happens when people use research is not simple. It's complex. So what we need when we're trying to understand it are methods that recognize that complexity. And there's lots of challenges when we're trying to understand research impact. As you all know, is it about what the researchers did or what research did or what research contributed or what about all the other things that were going on? The fact people cared about that change already, there was other people working on it. How do we trace the effects of our work. Do you remember um, uh, one of the diagrams today about how that really long tail from Stephen Hill, that really long tail, that impact takes a really long time, so how do we understand it? Um, what about all the other people working on the same change, and what about those wider influences and the things that could go wrong, or I don't know, what happens if there's a national, international pandemic? Those kind of things, yeah? Um, so I took a midlife PhD which was probably better than other kinds of midlife crises, um, and looked at what is research impact and how can it be assessed. <laughs> and I was doing a PhD, so I had to do definitions. You know this, don't you, right? So this is how I started defining research impact as I did that PhD. Because what I found was people got very excited about the things I'm calling research uptake. So they gave evidence at a committee. They had an event. They went and worked with the community. They set up a science shop. They were all very excited about all of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, but what happened? But so what? And, and no one could really answer that so what question. So we need, we need all of those wonderful activities to make research accessible, to engage people in it, but we've really got to think beyond that. And actually, my approach is, is a pathway to impact type approach, like my colleagues on the panel. So we need to think, what do people then do? And then what difference does it make? So that's the core of the model that we use at Matter of Focus. And so we think through, in a theory of change way, in a pathway to impact way, what happens between research uptake, research use, and research impact. And um, I, I referenced a paper in an earlier slide which shows this left-hand framework, which lots of people have used, and I've actually used the approach with research teams, with individuals, with international research consortiums. I've done some independent impact studies. Um, and so in, during that time, we've moved it from this quite technical-looking one on the left onto this much more plain language-looking one on the right. So this is the way we do it, a matter of focus. And we're actually we're quite proud of our plain language here, because what we're getting people to do is focus on process. <coughs> so what are the processes? And it doesn't really matter. A lot of these sort of logic models have short-term, medium-term, long-term. But how do you know what's going to be short or medium or long-term? You don't, really. So if you focus much more in on the processes of what's actually happening with whatever change you're trying to understand, it might be about research, it might be about a strategy, it might be about an organization, it might be about a partnership, any of those kind of things. You need to really understand what is the change we want to see before you can possibly understand, are we seeing it? So one of the things that I find is people quite often, they want indicators, they want measures. Well, you can't measure something until you're really clear about what it is you're measuring. And I think, come on, we're academics, we should know this, shouldn't we? But in, somehow in impact, we all lose that sense of, let's have some questions to ask first. And once we know the questions and we know what we're looking at, then let's think about how we 
then evidence it. So as I said, you can do that process at different levels. It might be a research project, it might be a program, maybe it's a consortium, maybe you'd have some nested pathways to impact at different levels, maybe it's a research group, maybe it's a grant fund, maybe it's your whole life work. I have done this process with someone who worked for their whole life on suicide and really setting out how, change, how he thought change had happened and then thinking about how we would evidence that. And then, having set that pathway to change out, then we need data specific to that context and that pathway. I like to call this a patchwork quilt of data and evidence that's tailored to the initiative that you're looking at. So these are examples, but these things might not be right for what you're doing, but you can think about what's right for what you're doing or what, you're trying, what change you're trying to understand. And um, this is in the paper that I referenced earlier, so looking at the sorts of things that you might consider at all these different levels. I know it's too small to see, but if you get the paper, you'll be able to see it uh, in much, much, much more clearly. But really thinking about, okay, well, who's engaged and involved? How are we going to understand engagement? What's important to us about engagement? Oh, how do people feel? What's get, what is it that's going to make them engage positively? What kind of ways might we work with these stakeholders? And actually, people do brilliant work engaging stakeholders as well, but it's completely invisible from any sort of assessment of what they've done. Um, and then I just wanted to conclude by talking a little bit about what I've learned from doing these independent case studies and working with these teams and really understanding kind of how impact happens and how we assess it. So the first one is, I'm sorry, but there's very rarely impact if you don't set out with an intention to have impact. So in one assessment, I did this big um, um, impact analysis for a huge investment that UK Research Council had made in genomics, and there were five centres. And of these five centres, or of these five centres, one of them had had a really clear impact intention. That was the only one we could find any evidence of impact for. There was just no evidence. Now, maybe something had happened, but there was no evidence. So this whole thing about leadership and setting a vision and being clear we care about this stuff is so important. The second one is that the people who involve non-academics from the beginning, not just when we finished our research project, let's find some now, but right from the beginning, as other people have said, are the things that are most impactful. And it can be painful. There was one assessment I was doing for some researchers um, in UNICEF, and they were getting into trouble because they were spending so long engaging stakeholders really well that they didn't have outputs. Where are your papers? Where are your outputs? And they're like, no, 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 just wait. And sure enough, over time, they had this amazing impact they influence policy in several countries uh, around violence against children. So it was really, they did the right thing, but the pressures were maybe on not to do that. Uh, lots of people have talked today about effort, time, and resources. So yeah, I'm not going to say any more about that because I feel it's been done. Um, but the, uh, another thing is, if we collect evidence as we do the work, it's going to be a lot easier to understand impact than if we wait till the end and then go, oh, I wonder what impact we had. Well, let's go back and try and piece stuff together. And I think it'll be really interesting to see from the REF stuff that Stephen was talking about earlier, the difference between... Ref 2014, which people were doing retrospectively, and Ref 2021, and did they get wiser about collecting evidence in that intervening period to show, um, to show what they'd done? And then, of course, learning from failure, accepting that it doesn't always go well. It's not all about these shiny, brilliant impact stories. Sometimes it might be awful, it might be difficult, things might go wrong. What do we do with that, and how do we really bring it together? So, just at the end, we run a research impact school which uses this method if you want to try it out. There's a code there for it. There's also a lot of resources around research impact assessment on our website that you're welcome to use. That are mostly free, and we do free webinars as well. And if you want to get in touch with me, please, here's some contact details. I'd love to keep the conversation going. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks, panel, for rapid-fire introductions on your impact assessment experiences in your lessons uh, learned. Um, I was struck by what Sarah said in her presentation about uh, uh, the language of impact. Um, panel members have used quite different terms, vocabulary, sometimes very specific to their fields. But I hope, I actually know you as experts in this area could build that bridge and translate that into the context of uh, the things you're more familiar with. Um, thanks again. Um, over to you. We have 20 minutes for discussion, for questions. This is your time.
Who would like to raise a question? Yes, here. Please introduce yourself and ask the question and tell us whether you want to ask the full panel or you have one person in mind. Thank you. I'm Giovanna Lima. I'm from Erasmus University Rotterdam. And I suppose my question is for Andrea, but happy to hear from the panel. Um, in research funding, we're hoping to advocate for a portfolio approach rather than a single project approach in terms of impact assessment. And I was hoping to hear from you if you, were, if you have a portfolio approach or if you individually look for impact into every single loan you have or if you are willing to accept the fact that some will fail, and as for in research, sometimes we have negative results, we're setting out to do something that is um, a challenge, and hopefully we will have positive impacts, but not for every single project that we are set out to do. So can we hear from you about that? Thanks. Okay. So uh, we assess every single loan, so, uh, we do in a more standardized way because uh, when a client comes to us, uh, first of all, we, uh, we start the relationship knowing better the client without assessing the impact, but we start assessing our relationship with them. And uh, we have uh, some exclusion criteria. So this is the first screening, for example, we don't finance uh, weapons, we don't finance tobacco, we don't finance uh, dangerous activities for the environment, uh, or we don't finance, for example, uh, sexual activities, uh, hazards, uh, and so on. We have uh, the full list uh, is, inside, is inside our credit policy, so it's formal. And uh, this is our first screening. So then uh, we assess the impact of every loan. So every client has to uh, fill in the questionnaire. And uh, sometimes we have uh, negative evaluations, even if uh, um, uh, we have those kind of exclusion criteria. But uh, if we have negative uh, social environmental evaluation and the client uh, seems to be uh, positive about uh, changing uh, how they uh, manage their, their activities, uh, we can uh, uh, start a relationship in order to change how they manage the activities. And we use mainly, uh, we, we are starting to use covenants for example, about emissions of CO2. Uh, we have covenants of them, and we also have covenants about the uh, model 231. I don't know if it's uh, also outside of Italy, but it's about the corruption, how to manage corruption. And uh, so uh, in some situations, uh, if the client is positive, we can also start this kind of process together because uh, it's not important to have also good clients, but it's also important to uh, try to change uh, what uh, bad clients for our perspective is, uh, is to change how they uh, affect the economy and not just uh, shut the door, because they can go to another bank uh, and have money from other banks. And uh, another thing is that we also have a ESG rating, and that is also a good instrument in order to make improvements of uh, not mainly not of external, as I said before, external impacts, but uh, maybe more in, in internal impacts. But uh, what we consider also internal impacts has also impacts outside. For example, the CO2 emission is, in, is on the part of CSR profile. And with the rating, if you have a higher rating, you will have a lower interest rates. So it's convenient for the clients to improve uh, their social responsibility profiles. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone, Peter, please? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Uh, I'll come in on that as well. Um, yes, uh, is, is the answer we've done in terms of, in terms of 
we, we look at each project on its own individually, but we do recognize that there's an inherent risk in our portfolio. There are, that we're, you know, we're doing infrastructure and developing economies and some stuff. That, uh, some, some things will even not take hold or you know, there's a lot of exogenous factors that will take place in terms of reasons why a project may no longer provide the expected development impact that we are expecting from, a, from the individual transaction. But similarly, we have incentives for that. So what we are, we have both processes internally to manage that. So in terms of our portfolio view, one of the slides I showed had a scatter diagram between the scores of our portfolio and the associated IRR, our credit risk associated with that. And so there's a piece internally that we are doing in terms of our capital allocation framework so that we are able to understand where the risk is in our portfolio. And that also affects our credit limits. So similarly, similarly, to, similarly we, give, um, you know, we have a higher credit limit for scores which potentially are more developmentally impactful, though we realize that there is a, that there is different distinctions that might occur there. One of the reasons, one of the things that the approach with which I showed in terms of our scorecard does is we are able to kind of articulate where the impact is occurring. So for instance, one of the higher risk areas is where the market transformation case score may be higher in an individual transaction. So you, so you say that this, this is a pilot project that's occurring in an underdeveloped state, and as a result, it, you know, um, it has the ability to do, to do this in improving the efficiency of the market via a demonstration and replication effect. However, we also know that that, uh, again, is a pilot project with a relative risk, and so we're able to incorporate that into our credit committees and our assessments at, uh, in, our, in our investment committees as well. Thank you. One sp small addition, yeah, please. Yeah. If I can add one thing. Um, I didn't say during my slide that the social evaluators goes directly to meet the clients where they operate. Uh, because you can collect all the data that you want, but uh, when you go there and see how employees are, you see how the structures are, you feel <laughs> the energy uh, around the organization and uh, where they are located above the communities, uh, this is very helpful to understand uh, if there will be an impact or not. And we know that uh, it's, it's difficult to replicate our model because we are very lucky to have uh, those members really involved uh, in, uh, in our project uh, and they go everywhere in Italy and Spain and uh, they do uh, mainly for free. They just have some money for transportation, etc. cetera. Uh, what I would say for bigger banks, uh, and it's also what we do for uh, the part of asset management that we do with another company, part of the group, uh, the first filter of, of exclusion criteria is the best helpful tool in order to be sure to not have negative impacts. That, uh, that is the main ob objective that uh, other banks uh, could have uh, in this kind of society. Okay. Somebody else? I warned you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just in time. Nice. <laughs> this microphone coming. I will keep standing up, you'll see me then. Um, it was mentioned a couple of times. Um, I think um, Ms. Orazbaeva, sorry for the pronunciation, but you mentioned it explicitly. So data management is very important throughout the whole cycle of the project, uh, throughout the whole impact logic cycle. Um, data quality is one thing. Uh, uh, how do you monitor that? How do you also monitor data sincerity? Is there a tendency to polish up data with you, with your clients? That's a very good question. Thank you so much. Um, and I think I will also probably repeat what Sarah has mentioned. <laughs> you gotta collect the evidence as you go. So this, um, because that also will help them to, I guess, collect better quality data. It also really very much depends on the intention, um, as it was also mentioned before. So 
if the uh, exercise is done for, let's say, reporting purposes, if you have to report back on your grant project, then uh, you're going to look for some of the specific indicators that is probably very easy to verify. But if the idea would then be to really position university more from the reputational perspective, then the question is, of course, a little bit different. But I think there are ways to verify the data. In our experience, well, it's very hard to say, really, um, what kind of data those universities will be collecting, because luckily it's also not our job to manage that for them. Um, as you can imagine, many academics are also quite unhappy with reporting so much data. So we were actually asking that question when we were doing our own survey. How often would you like to report that kind of data when it comes to your engagement? And you know, in our case, we would say we need lots of data. It's not only research, it's also education. Basically, all of your collaborational activities that you have. And the average that we have received in terms of willingness to provide that kind of information would be approximately on an annual basis. And then ideally, if you would again speak with academics on how they would like to report that kind of data. Of course, self-reporting would be a best possible way. Having some sort of dashboard where they can report this data as they go would also minimize perhaps the annoyance with the exercise and at the same time also help with increasing the quality of that kind of data. Um, Roundtable discussions and all of that. So what we recommend universities and, and uh, we've done it, I've done it myself when I used to work at the University um, of Applied Sciences in Germany, we also were tasked with that responsibility to report on that kind of data. And speaking from both, like wearing both hats, uh, I can say that not making academics doing it too often would be a very good idea, but also trying to identify best possible ways where you can actually collect that data, because Many of the things you can also collect through different kinds of events where, speaking about engagement specifically, when you organize an alumni event and you can already track how certain activities are taking place. So that would be a very, very long answer to your question, but then uh, the, the idea would be, is that I, I would think, to think really about what are the indicators that you have, what can you measure with those indicators, and what would be the best possible data collection methods that you can have in your system, how often can you collect this data, where you can get this data from, and, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a certain a checklist I, I can imagine that you can have in place in order to make that system more smooth, both for yourself if you are the one analyzing the data, but also to get your academics on board uh, so that they would be happy to actually report that kind of data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we work with lots of organizations who are like tracking their own impact. So that whole thing about is it someone external scrutinizing or are you doing it yourself is a really core question. And I suppose with, with our approach and lots of approaches, you've got to make a good enough case. So you're using the logic of the model to show how things happen and then you're bringing evidence to each part and you're it's not really about the data, it's about the analysis, isn't it? Like, the data doesn't speak for itself, so you've got to do good enough analysis on that data that's transparent enough for people to judge like they do any other sort of output that's based on evidence, any kind of research. So we're really getting people to think about, you know, how do they make sure that they're really looking at the data and considering it, and I think what's really important about that, actually, that process of sitting down together and looking at data and thinking about what is it telling us? Where are the holes? Is it good enough? And we have a software system that allows people to rate their progress across their pathway, but also to rate the confidence in their evidence. Mm -hmm. So um, they have a transparent way of rating that confidence in their evidence, which would be pretty a, a normal way of doing those sorts of things. So, so people then start to say, well, we're highly confident in this evidence. Well, if you're going to say that about yourself, you need to really show what that evidence is. Otherwise, what, how, and people are just going to go, what? Mm -hmm. um, and, and my, my one of my favorite moments in using this approach was I presented it to a very skeptical economist, the approach. Um, it was actually the same, the same um, example with UNICEF that I, that I, before. And then I went away and did this impact study and came back and presented it with results. And the very skeptical economist said, 
fair enough. And I thought, oh, yeah. I've been pra done praise, but that, I think I've convinced an economist that this is a fair enough method. Yeah. So you, sure. it's as robust as the way you use it. And, and, and I suppose it all depends on who you're telling the story to. Is it for yourselves? Is it for a mm -hmm. funder? Mm -hmm. Is it for an institution? Is it for whatever? And then that will then vary. And some of these stories will inevitably be quite shiny looking stories that universities want to show how great they are with. And others will be much more honest stories where people are really trying to understand a change and, yeah. and claim they're part of it. I can imagine that is quite different in a, in a, in a high stakes context like, like, like the REF. You know, there's, yeah. there's that challenge indeed for, oh, we must perform well, we must show off. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Peter, you want to, to yeah, add to that? Yeah, I'm just going to come in with a little bit of an example. Everyone, uh, you know, if you've dealt with any economists, you know the phrase, phrase garbage in, garbage out, you know, if you, with regards to your data. But um, uh, not to talk about a stage of garbage in, but one of the things that we are just going through our annual reporting cycle at this moment in time for collecting data for our annual review. But the process of that is twofold to kind of update our expectations on how these deals are doing in terms of their sustainable development impact, but also capture our operational data. So, for example, one of the things Sarah's just talked about is the external validation of data. So one, one component I'll say is we have a task force on climate-related financial disclosures and our greenhouse gas emissions. And we have sponsors who are are not familiar with these, uh, you know, with, with such disclosures. They're reporting it back to an investor. They are not collecting or having their own results verified. So we're getting, um, we may be getting unverified data in terms of the amount of coal used in a particular project on the amount of diesel burnt in a rural mini grid, for instance. And so as a result of that, the, that you know that literacy comes over time with engagement with with sponsors uh, to develop that o over time. But so that, uh, but we, you know at the same time we need to go through a robust uh, assurance process. So not only is it viewed and viewed by the data collectors who collect it within our sub companies, but then we also have compliance and review who kind of look look at this against historical norms to see whether it's way out or not, and then we try and capture some of that in our process. Later, you want to? Yes, I want to come. You've been yes. silent so far, yeah. so. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to tell uh, that uh, it is not only about reporting because sometimes we need to take the thoughts indicators, but we need to focus all of the time that the here the issue, the problem, it is to, to try to do some challenge and to change the world to a better world. So because of that, yes, an example that we have that when we go to dialogue with uh, the stakeholders of the, of the organization, we ask about the social value that they generate for them. So for example, we have a, a company in which one of the mothers of a disability girl were really happy and they explained the narrative was like, oh, my child went alone to work with the underground or with the bus, so that's why it is crazy for me. What is going to the report? We are going to one point, the salary, because the company is paying for these disability people, so because of that we have in the this market value that I explained before, but then we have a second part that is no market value. It is because first, the mother is happy, we will see which is the emotional value, I'm not going to explain just now how to, to measure that one. But the second one that we call measure and we call quantitative, quantitatively indicate, and also with euros, it is that the mother has free time maybe to go to work, to go to sports or whatever, because in another way, she will take care of his, her health. So the time, and the time it is possible to measure with euros, because we could establish that one hour free time, it is 15 euros or whatever. Uh, the third point is not market value as well. Why? Because normally disability people that is working, they are not going to the healthcare system. So because of that, we are going to reduce all of those externalities. So we are going to get positive externalities. So you see that this is not only about reporting, but reporting gives us the information to measuring. And the point is that maybe we do that one the first, we get those indicators, we evaluate with euros, of course, but the next time, the next year, or after three years, we go again. And what is changing? It is the same, it is better, we have created more value for those families. So I think that uh, my 
theory, it is that, okay, we are trying to focus on impact, we ask about outcomes, and we back to the outputs, and we are mm -hmm. using reporting outputs. So it's like, like, like the inverse of whatever everyone is doing in the impact. That's the point that I want to, yeah. to share with, with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have skillfully prevented me uh, from asking questions, so well done. <laughs> uh, it's almost five o'clock, so I'll close this session. I'm looking around whether there are announcements, practical announcements. Okay, well, one more round of applause, please, for Thank the panel. Very. is coming. No, there's the microphone. Okay, it's easier like that. I don't have to shout. Um, so thank you for staying until the end. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long journey. Now the fun part starts, the social part starts. So some instructions. So at quarter past five, the first group goes um, to the guided visit uh, to the Guggenheim Museum. It is the guided visit that is taking place in, Spain, in Spanish. Uh, you have uh, all in your registration, you have ES for those that are going to that visit. Um, and you are meeting downstairs at the entrance, quarter past five. The other group goes a little bit later, so you can take it slowly. <laughs> and it is at uh, 20 quarter to six, same place downstairs at the exit of, of the building. Um, then for those uh, that are not going to the Guggenheim Museum, but um, you can enjoy the free time. And then there is the dinner at Cafe Ruña at half past eight. If you are there a little bit before, better. Uh, so we can have a smooth uh, entry, ent entrance to the, to the restaurant. Thank you very much and see you later. Thank you. <laughs>